how do you use vulnerability in your coaching? So but I you, use it. Yeah, I use it. I use it strategically and intentionally. And when I say that, I know those are probably catchphrases, but those are my phrases. And that's how I use it. You can use your vulnerability as preferably as a leader in an example of being that example, being an empathetic ear being aware of things around you, being aware of the people that you're leading, giving them room to develop, giving them room to be innovative. So that's what I structure on when I coach and consult with with others and my clients. I kind of tell them, be more self-aware of the surroundings. Take on things as if you were in that person's shoes. That's what really affords you to be a good leader. Vulnerability is your superpower. Carl Sean Watkins empowers executives and leaders to transform their vulnerability into a superpower. He helps executives grow their vulnerability leadership mindset. And in working with his clients, Carl Sean collaborates to help them use vulnerability strategically and intentionally to identify obstacles and map out a direct and concise strategic plan. Carl Sean has over 25 years of business leadership and business culture fortitude in the financial, mortgage, and presently the legal services arena. He successfully pivoted his career from financial services to legal services and to now business consultant. He's also pursuing his law degree. Listen and learn practical tips from Carl Sean about how to make vulnerability your superpower. And follow Carl Sean on LinkedIn. I've put a link in the show notes. He's posting about this all the time and doing LinkedIn Lives as well. The Onward Podcast is brought to you by my business, Emily Harmon Coaching and Consulting. Join us live every Wednesday night at 730 Eastern on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. This episode was published live a few months ago. And so you'll hear me and my guest, Carl Sean, talk talking to uh, people as they post comments, reading their comments, responding to their comments. That's the fun part of being live. So let's get to the interview with Carl Sean. The Onward Podcast is all about facing adversity, moving forward, and then discovering ourselves along the way. And Carl Sean's a perfect guest today. And let's bring him on. There he is, Carl Sean Watkins. Hey, Emily. Good to be here. Good yeah. to be a part of it. I'm excited. Are you guys getting any rain? We got a lot of rain today in Virginia. And then I know you guys are getting some like tornadoes possibly and yes, in the Philly area. Yes, it's uh, pretty bad. It was uh, starting to get dark actually early. 11, 12 o'clock started getting a little bit darker and uh, really, really dark way before way before the evening time saying and of course now it's, it's pretty black but i can hear i can hear the rain beating down and the wind blowing now as we speak so well hopefully you won't lose any power no hopefully i lost power today we lost power oh you guys lost power yeah but my parents oh, wow. didn't so i could have gone oh, over that's there. <laughs> yeah i had a backup plan <laughs> well yeah that's good well at least it's back on now and, and it was no, yeah. no damage no structural damage or anything no and you, you know, you're a veteran about having a backup. Oh, man. man. Yeah, you got to. You got to. You got to. Hurry up oh. and wait. That's what it's all about, right? Hurry up and wait. <laughs> That's right. Where'd you learn that? In the Army? Because I learned it in the yeah. Navy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I, I think I think it's part of the government teaching. Hurry up and wait. The uh, armed forces, yes. Teaches you uh, teaches you quick patience. Move, uh. move quickly, but stay still as well. So. Yeah, right. So tell us a little bit about yourself. You're You're a business culture consultant. You're an executive coach. You're going to law school. You're an army veteran. Yes. So uh, a little more. Yeah, I just I started the the business course on Marcus Consultant after working with corporate and working for so many years. The pandemic kind of got me uh, in a realm where I was able to reprioritize have some thinking and some things. And, and want to, for so many reasons, we get jobs and we work on jobs for the fact that we got to pay bills. And a lot of times our, our, our job, titles or our course of action with jobs or companies we get with don't always align with our passions because mm -hmm. a lot of times they are pushed to the side because we have to make an income. We have to provide families ourselves. Yeah. So a lot of times those things get pushed on the side. And as far as the law is concerned, I always want to be a lawyer. I can remember the days of being young, watching, spending on my grandmother used to babysit me after school and I would watch 
she watched the old Perry Mason movies and I was just enamored by just looking at Perry Mason, just getting up there and just doing this thing and, and people just like tell them everything they want to know. And, <laughs> and at that point in time, I really had no idea or even could identify what was going on. I just was, it, it just enthused me and it was something that, that I saw, hey, I want to do that. And most kids see things and like, yeah, I want to do that. But I had no concept as to uh, what it really took to do that or what was necessary to do that. But that's how I came about with the law thing. And just after that, it kind of became as a passion for me. I love to read. So that was one of the criteria, come to find out now, that was really helpful to yeah. me. I started reading really early and I read everything, comic books, newspapers, magazines, sports books. And I played basketball, football in high school. So being a jock, that kind of, that kind of helped me with the reading because I had a, a little business then could have sold papers uh -huh. to the football team. I would pay, they would have them do uh, 20 bucks a page for doing their homework or doing their quiz and that kind of thing. Oh, I can't think of that thing now with the plagiarism, but it was just uh, such an often occurrence back then. We call it tutoring, but for the most part, you was just giving answers. Mm -hmm. And that's how I built. So after, after I graduated from high school, I wasn't really ready to go to college. And I will say that from a point of not education. I, I was like, I wanted to break because like I had threw myself so much into school and I was kind of like, I want a break. I just want a break. So I went to the Can army. you go to the army for a break? Yeah. 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 You're looking at, I mean, you're looking at a 19 year old. I graduated from school at 18. I graduated early, a year early because I had skipped a grade. And I, here I was, uh, 18 year old. And I didn't want to work because everyone in Chicago was working. Like kids were either working at the malls or factories and I was like, yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to do that. And I didn't want to go to school. So my mom gave me a couple of ultimatums. She mm -hmm. said either work, school, or the military. Those are the three things. And uh, me as a kid wanting to get out the neighborhood, wanting to get out the gangs, the drugs, those kind of things. I said, maybe I'll join the Army. That gives me an opportunity to travel. And back then, the Army, back yeah. in the early 80s, it's like, yo, be all you can be. They had the commercials on and you could travel the world. And they just built it up as this great big action plan for you to do. And I was like, hey, that's it. I'm in. So here I was in 19, I did my duty station in Kentucky, Fort Knox. And after I graduated, they shipped me off to Stuttgart, Germany. Yeah, 19 year old in wow. Germany. First time out of Chicago without my parents, without it being a road trip to grandma's down south. <laughs> so I'm on my own, 19, and I'm in Germany. The pleasant thing about it was that at that point in time, America was pretty much liked. So you being a soldier overseas was kind of like a real big deal and you really was respected. So I didn't fall into a lot of things that way, but I always had a problem as a young kid. I was uh, molested as a kid and that turned to alcohol abuse and then that abuse turned to depression. So I hit the depression so much by playing sports, throwing myself in the books, not talking to nobody about it, but it really crept up on me when I got to the military because it was just me. So sort of mm -hmm. like that me, myself, and I. Mm -hmm. And I got to a point where we had a duty station and we were stationed um, in one tanker, uh, a tank commander, and we step on our tanks out in the field uh, training. And one night we had 45 as our sidearm. And I sat on the tank and I just contemplated and ended it. I said, well, if I end it, there will be no more problems, uh, kind of like solve things. And I think this is where your mind goes when the depression gets to that point. And I just sat there and I just pulled the trigger three times. It, of course, it didn't go off because I'm here with you. But the ironic thing about that is on the third one, it never jammed. And I got really angry saying, I can't even kill myself right. It's like, you got to be kidding me. So I took the, uh, took and put my clip back in and looked at the uh, top of the bullet and the bullet was still in the chamber. So... I didn't have this big epiphany. The skies didn't open up. It wasn't this glory, hallelujah, singing or whatever it was. But the moon shined so bright on that night. And it, it was just something mysterious and spiritual about the whole thing. And at that point in time, I went back after training. We, went, we wrapped up for the weekend. We went back to the base. And I fell out of everything that I was doing before I went out to training. I didn't want to drink no more. That kind of disgusted me. Some of the actions that the soldiers was doing, the partying, the, the, the prostitution, the, all of that, it really just, just gave me a disdain for being around that. And I couldn't explain what had happened.
Why the gun didn't go off? I don't know why it didn't go off. I said, thank God that it didn't. And I, now me being a more spiritual person and in line with my relationship with God, I know he had something for me to do. And it was a reason behind it. And I share that story not so much for the point of looking for someone to say, oh, my God. I mm-hmm. share that story because there are those that are in those situations that are really unaware as what's the next move. And there I was, if you looked at me, I was a perfectly fit 19 year old kid, played two sports in high school, letterman jackets, the whole nine. I was very popular, social popular. Back then, them days wasn't the phones and the social media, but I had all the kids, I knew kids from other high schools because mm-hmm. I played sports. I mean, if you looked at me on the outside, you say, wow, that kid got it all going on. But in the inside, I was so tormented and torn with a lot of demons and things that I was dealing with. And I had nobody to tell that to. Who, who do you tell at that age as a young African-American man that you're from Leslie? Who, I mean, who do you share that with? Who, who do you give that information to? Mm-hmm. And I fought with that for a long time. But upon that day, I started getting clarity in my life and what it was for me to do. And it wasn't for me to sit on what happened to me. It was for me to share it. And I go with the strategically and intentionally because at points in time, I don't get on LinkedIn and you probably never see me post that story. And I probably never will, but I've shared it a couple of times on different shows and I've shared it to the, to the intention that someone's listening, know that there's an avenue, know that there's a way out. And that way out is just believing whether you get a relationship with God or your higher power or whatever you call it, and just reprioritize your importance in your life. And the pandemic, it, it kind of helped us all in that because mm-hmm. it was a reset. Mm-hmm. I sort of say that like if you play in a game and the game ends, you reset it, you go back to the beginning. That's what the pandemic really allowed us to do. It allowed us to reset our relationships. It allowed us to reset our thought process. It allowed us to slow down, reset our family home, our structure, what was important to us. So I really took advantage of that. And that's how I started the business. And this is where I am now. Wow. So when I, <clears throat> when people come on my show, first off, let's say thank you. Thank you, Russ, for joining us. And hi, Charlene. And we've got Nadine here. Thank you, thank guys. you guys. I appreciate you guys uh, watching this and commenting. And if you have any questions for Carl Sean, let us know. And what'd you say? Two awesome people here. Oh, thanks, Russ. So you you gave me this title, Vulnerability is Your Superpower. I know with you that that is not some kind of attention headline grabbing thing where you're just saying, yeah, let's talk about it, but you don't really mean it. You mean it and you live it it every day. So what is vulnerability to you? What do you mean when you, when you say the word vulnerability? When I say it, I do not pick up the Merriam-Webster dictionary. That definition is not how I define vulnerability. And what I tell people when I define it, the, the act of vulnerability is just the ability for you to confront the things that you are fearful of. A lot of times people try to put vulnerability in different categories and, and different genres of, of fear. And it's all fear-based. It's all fear-related. It's all subjective to what someone is going to say concerning me. What is someone going to divulge concerning my shortcomings? How are mm-hmm. they going to make me feel concerning things I don't know? And all of that is derived from fear. So when you're able to face the fear of not letting it drive you, then you're able to embrace your vulnerability because it's it, it's very well, and it's so exhilarating to say you don't know something. How much pressure that relieves? Oh, yeah. You know what? Did Carl do this? No, I don't know it. And I'm happy to for you to show me. We were, when I was a plebe at the Naval Academy, though, I don't know is not, was not an answer. It was, I mean, you probably had this, you know, yes, sir, no, sir, or I'll find out, sir. <laughs> I'll find out. <laughs> no, you don't say you on, I don't know, be, it, it, be, me being a young, young little uh, hood kid when I got to the military, I don't know, I said a couple of times, but that put me on KP duty, that kept me in a few days. <laughs> so after a little bit of time there, I came to understand that I don't know was not an answer. And right. it was definitely not one you was going to use with anyone, especially if their rank was above yours. <laughs> yes, you go find out. How do you use vulnerability in your coaching? So but I you- use it. Yeah, I use it. I use it strategically and intentionally. And when I say that, I know those probably catchphrases, but those are my phrases. And that's how I use it. You can use your vulnerability as preferably as a leader, an example of being that example, being an empathetic ear, 
being aware of things around you, being aware of the people that you're leading, giving them room to develop, giving them room to be innovative. So that's what I structure on when I coach and consult with with others and my clients. I kind of tell them, be more self-aware of the surroundings. Take on things as if you were in that person's shoes. That's what really affords you to be a good leader. If I can come in as a leader, and I use the example a lot of times I use with, with clients, I say, okay, you come in from work. You come into work, you come into the office, you had a horrible drive there. Somebody cut you off, you mad, you gave them the finger, you cursing them out in the windows, they can't hear you. So here you come into the office. This is your place. Your name is on the uh, building and you come in through the receptionist. Now, instead of you greeting the receptionist with a pleasant greeting, you come in, you slam the door behind you, go straight to your office and slam the door. Okay, what has that created? Yes, it is your place. Yes, your name is on it. Yes, you pay everybody. But Minus those three things. They work for you. They putting in the outcome. They're putting in the production that pays you the other three that you decided that that was yours. So now you look at it as saying, and I've done this with clients and I'm telling them, now you go look at it and I'm going to give you something that's very, very simple for you to do. Now you have the receptionist who don't know how to treat you because you came in with that attitude. Not only that, the coworkers have probably heard this because it has trickled through to the rest of them. And they're not as productive as they are because they don't know what the outcome is going to be with you. Right. And now you have a whole list of others that are not really performing or not really giving you the opportunities or giving you the successful things that you need for your business to continue to grow. This is why I say it's a direct correlation into the growth and development of your business. And you come in as a vulnerable leader, first thing your stop should be, and I told them this, so the receptionist, yo, give me about 10 minutes. I had a rough drive to work this morning. I got cut over. Just want to take a breather before I interact, before I take calls. Before I get messages, just give me a couple minutes. Now, what that is presented to you as, first of all, an owner and a leader that's in control, mm -hmm. that has self-control, that also has given the confidence <clears throat> to your secretary or your receptionist that, oh, wow, look at the boss that I'm looking. That's also giving her a safe place to say, if I come in and those happen to me, I can tell him that. He's empathetic to that. He understands right. that. And now you continue with the work going on because nothing has been disrupted. So what did that take from you being the CEO? Nothing. What does that take from you signing the checks? Nothing. But what that has given you is more respect as a vulnerable leader. And it has given you more credibility to when things are at their best or at their worst, people will still look to you to lead them. Yeah, definitely. That's a really good example that you gave because I think we can all relate to that. So <clears throat> some people might think vulnerability might mean you have to share like everything that's going on in your personal life. No. And I wrote, and I wrote there as a post, uh, I think it was over the last week I wrote there in a post. Some of the most vulnerable leaders that I've ever came across that have trained and poured into me, I didn't know a lot about them personally. Their vulnerability just came through through their actions. They were the ones, and I'll say, I'll say when you're dealing with somebody in vulnerability, it's a signal. I sent out one as a vulnerable person to a person too. Person two receives that signal and it's how person two reacts that creates the safe space for me to continue to be vulnerable. So that's what makes us vulnerable leaders. So when you're telling me, I'm not only listening to your excuses that I may think they are because you're not getting the job done. What I'm doing is being an active listening and say, okay, this is going on. That is going on. How can I make this a better situation for her so her so she can perform? That's what's being a vulnerable leader about. It's not you coming in dumping and saying, oh my God, woe is me. It's a thunderstorm. I can say there's a thunderstorm outside. I got tornado warnings. My watch has been going off. I had to cut it off. I said, no, nah, I'm not going to do this show tonight. No, I have to show up. Mm -hmm. And those things that have to show up makes you that leader where someone can say, yo, it's something different about that guy. Something different about that lady. Something different about that person. Yeah. And, and it gives others permission to be vulnerable too. So let's yeah, see. Absolutely. I think we had oh yeah so russ said vulnerability shows authenticity absolutely they, those two are tied a lot of time and i say my little catchphrase diversity diversity and inclusion is really what i practice and what i teach on but i add the vulnerability part to it and it's very important because diversity everybody checks the boxes we got all kind of hires and we put all of those things in place governmental wise and company wise and corporate wise but how is the inclusion with that? Well, the inclusion can't happen because the vulnerability from the leaders of the hierarchy of the hierarchy haven't included the diversity. Of, so therefore there is none. So I said, diversity is being invited to the dance. I said, uh, inclusion is being asked to dance, but vulnerability is knowing your dancing partner. So now there brings a relationship of inclusion. 
And that's my equation. Diversity plus vulnerability equals inclusion. If we put that equation in and what I teach and train and coach with that, if we can get that equation off to the hierarchy to understand that it doesn't take from you to include those that work for you. Yeah, no, yeah. true. Charlene says, what has been the top two positive transformation you've witnessed, transformations you've witnessed using vulnerability in business? Well, the top one, the one, one, one that really sticks out with me, and it's it's a total transformation of a client I have, and I won't say her name. She's on LinkedIn, and she was a LinkedIn, uh, I wouldn't even say social butterfly. She was a LinkedIn like cocoon. Uh, she had been on LinkedIn for such a long period of time, and she got laid off. She had been on a job 26 years, and she got laid off. And uh, she saw a show that I did, and and I said some things, and I and I, and I encouraged her. So she DM'd me, and she was like, "Yo, I want to work with you. I want to I, I want to learn." She's like, "I'm in the cell. I'm not depressed, but I am depressed because I'm not working, and I don't even know how to go back out and do this. I've been on the same job 26 years." Yeah. So I, I took her on as a uh, client, and the transformation of me just putting back the self esteem in her that she had lost and I mean not ready to jump off a bridge not ready to commit suicide but just the cares of life had dragged her so much to me being an inspiration to her and sharing that was a good transformation in it and she just recently got a job she DM'd me and told me that she got a job she got hired and actually was making more than she was before <laughs> from the other place she was and she said a lot of it was the tools and things that I told her to use as far as speaking to people, speaking with confidence, what I'm saying, just the little things that actually we learned as kids, but we lost yeah. along the way. You know what I mean? Looking someone in the eye, being confident in your response, being able to articulate what you mean, being able to stay behind what you mean, being able to stand up for what you feel. Those kind of things have always garnered respect and we've lost that because everybody now wants to slick and connive and be sliding and try to get over and those things and and we've lost our way with that. But that was that was one of the most positive ones. Another positive one is actually working with Charlene. I, I can use her because I work with her, uh, introvert and one that uh, is not always looking for the spotlight, but is a genius in the mindset. And we've been working together, and just I can just see the transformation in her and just her interacting, her networking, her being able to not that I made her articulate, but being able to articulate what people are seeing hearing, understanding, and seeing the value and worth in her. And that's what makes impacts for me. It's not all about me signing a paycheck or either getting paid. A lot of times it's about just seeing someone change from where they were to how they are. And that brings yeah. a big difference. Yeah. So how did you meet Charlene? Was it through LinkedIn too? Yes, it was through LinkedIn. We were in a uh, growth academy. Shout out to Sinead Moray. We was in growth academy. And uh, I, I think it was, we was doing videos. It was a video challenge. And at that time, I really didn't need to do videos. I had my show for over a year. I had pretty much a nice network. So it was a point of that, but I needed a direction. And this is where a coach having a coach comes into play. You don't always have the answers. And I was looking for a strategy. I was looking for an arena in which to build this. I had been talking about vulnerability for about two years. I had not getting been getting any traction people were liking and hugging and 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 insightful and doing all of that on the post but i wasn't really moving the needle and i got with shanae and she started talking about videos and strategically plan of how to do them how to put them out and charlene was in there and she was alone for that and we kind of like stuck it up she was kind of like where well, you have these connections with people and you have this 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 networking that comes about you start learning about people in different ways because you're seeing different things and it, she was so vulnerable in essence of how she felt about what she wasn't good at. And that just gave me the opportunity to highlight what she was good at. Mm -hmm. And that, that mess right there. And that just that just budded into a friendship and a connection that I have for life now, regardless of anything. So many didn't, yeah, especially, I guess, during COVID. But yeah, <clears throat> so many friendships develop through so, LinkedIn. Yes. It is. It is. I'm, I'm looking at all the ones. I mean, I'm going to Arizona in a couple of weeks on the 25th, I think, something like that. And I'm going to meet up with uh, Tisha Marie. And she's already invited me to say we're going to go to lunch. And I look forward to that. And I look forward to just meeting some of the ones that over these past two years, through COVID, me having COVID, through all the deaths in my family, to loved ones being lost, to jobs, and all kind of things. These people that was on LinkedIn were there for me. 
they were my rock. They were my foundation. And man, what a good feeling it would see to actually be able to meet some of these ones in per in person and like hug them and like, yo, you were there in my darkest moments. It, it's it, it, it's nothing more impactful than that. Yeah, definitely. Russ says, I love how you care for people, how you live your faith. You're a great man of God. Thank you, Carl. Yes. Yes, Russ. God showed me who he was on, on that tank that day. And from that point on, I can't leave him out of anything I'm doing, whether I'm not always talking about him because some people talk to him about religion and politics. It's no place for that. I can always mm -hmm. put God in what I'm talking about because it's all things. And I can always share him with whoever I'm dealing with because he's real to me. And, and, and that's what it is. So I don't have a problem with that. And sharing that love is who he is. Right. So love, love is what I show. Yep. And uh, Russ says, I'm grateful to call you both great friends. Yeah, I met, I met well. uh, Russ through LinkedIn. And then yeah. Nadine said, uh, uh, Emily, I met you via LinkedIn while you were still at the Navy. Yeah, she messaged me and... Um, I was driving. I was driving up to take care of my former husband who was sick. And we talked on the phone. I remember that, Nadine. And then Nadine sent me. Look what she sent me. Hold on. Something I got through LinkedIn from Nadine. Mail to me. Let's see. Wait. My dog is a little afraid of it, but it's, it's so cute. So I have this in my family room. But thank you, Nadine. Yeah. So what are the ways that you make these connections on LinkedIn. You have a show coming up. You're going to be on um, on a clubhouse tomorrow night, right? Creating authentic yeah. connection through vulnerability. So, yeah. you know, for people watching that are like, well, I didn't need friends over LinkedIn. How does, how does that happen? How do you do that? It's with anything. And what I've really learned, and I think the focus is, I can thank the army for that, is giving me focus with intention. And a lot of times we don't do things with intentions. We just do things. And when that happens, outcomes don't favor us because we weren't intentional. We're pushing those outcomes. And when I say that, no, that's not a tongue twister. That's just all actuality. I've been intentional about networking on LinkedIn. Not so much as, okay, I'm in law, you're in law. What can we talk about? Lawyers, I have about 200 or so in my network. I don't message them. And it's not that I have anything against them. I'm, I'm in the field that they're in. Eventually, I'm going to be doing some of the things that they're doing. And I want to be a beacon for some of them to think differently than they are. But that's down the line. When I came on LinkedIn, I want to network with those that were different than me, that can engage me in a perspective and a conversation that was different than mine. That's what really draws it. When I go on, I don't look for the same person as me. I look for someone different. I listen to their perspective. I apply it to minds and I see how we can work together with that. And that's what I did. I go into my network. I do Zoom calls. Yes, I do Zoom calls. I ain't got time for Zooms and that take up my time. And that's building, that's building the foundation. That's laying the bricks because through those Zoom calls, someone personally now sees you. They can interact with you. They're more favorable with the post that you're posting. They also know about you to tell you about others, to tell mm -hmm. others about you. So right. therefore, when you're intentional, the networking does its own work because I don't have to get on and continually brag about the service I offer. Yeah, I don't think maybe once, twice, on one hand, I can say that I've actually got on and I've actually posted on there what I do in my coaching and consulting. I don't get on and make that up. That's not, that's not I'm not selling anything. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a salesman. I'm not selling that. But what I am providing is a connection. So there in the connection through conversation, I learn about you. When me learning about you, I offer what I know. And by me offering what I know, if I've solved that problem, you'll tell others. That's how you close deals. That's how you close sales. That's how you help people. That's how you impact lives intentionally. That's awesome. Uh, Rusty, what time on Clubhouse? It's at 7 o'clock Eastern. 7 Eastern, Rusty. You out west, buddy. That'll be 4 for you, I think, right? Yep. yep. For you. Yes, we'll be in the uh, intentional. Or you just want to find me, just find me at uh, Carl Sean. Just look me up. We're going to be talking about what's really important in the connection. And vulnerability goes along with everybody's everything. You can't leave it out. <laughs> yeah. It's not, like, it's not like you can get rid of it. And it actually enhances all things that you really want to do. Once you face mm -hmm. that, once you understood that, once you use that to your benefit and your advantage, you'll realize that, wow, how authentic now is our relationship, seeing that I've let you into some things that will maybe bother me, maybe I was afraid of, 
Maybe I was fearful to talk. Now there's a closeness that no one else can talk about because I've divulged that with you. You felt that with me. Don't get me wrong. Let me go to the disclaimer part of that. Yes, some people will abuse that access. Absolutely. So I don't want to sit on here and talk like it's Disney and it's all rides and amusement parks. Mm -hmm. Some people will get that information. Some people will use it to try to hurt you. But the power that comes in that is you. It's all based on you. The vulnerability is individual. So what you individually let keeps you in a fear box will be that person's power. So when you get tired of them having power over you, regain your power, take it back, live your life. Yeah. It's really just that simple. I know people say it's not, but it really is. And I guess you can say, Carl, you say it's that simple, man, because that's how you've been living. I had to get there and I had to trust and believe in me. No one else would. No one else would. So when you're sitting around saying, yo, I got this business idea and I don't know if it's going to get off the ground. Well, if you don't know, nobody else does. Yeah. <laughs> so if you don't believe in yourself, then it is what it is. Well, how did you end up? How, how what gave you the courage to believe in yourself? I did an inventory. So I think there's something that everybody should do. Inventory yourself, not of what you have, not of things you own, not of possessions. Inventory you. What kind of person are you? What kind of person are you? Write it down. I write it down. I wrote down things that I wanted to work on when the pandemic started. And I looked at that list a couple of weeks ago and I've just about scratched off all the things that I wanted to do. You were intentional. I was intentional about, okay, I don't want to suffer with this no more. Okay, I don't want to be fearful of that no more. Okay, when you start doing that, you start putting a name to it. My grandma used to say that all the time. She said, baby, if you're scared of something, put a name to it. Once you find out his name, talk about it. And once you talk about it, it'll leave. Me being a kid, I had no idea what she was talking about. Just a Southern grandparent just telling me some Southern stuff. But I started believing in that. When something was fearful to me, I would, I would call it out. I would say what it was. I'm tired of not being able to talk in front of people. I'm tired of not being able to articulate how I feel. Then I start working on it. Okay, well, how can I read this? How can I do with my speech? How can I learn to talk? How can I take classes to do? How can I better myself? Then became the power. Because once I removed the fear, I became empowered by what I've just learned. Yeah. And this is where we cut ourselves short from. And so many people on LinkedIn has been in so many tremendous areas and places of their life. And they're still hiding behind those vulnerability walls that they have up fearful of what someone will say concerning them. And once you let that out, once you let that cat out the bag, so to speak, then the power is all yours. You will see how good you feel. It's the only way that I can really say it. You will see how good you feel when you're empowered to do the things that you love to do. Well, what you're saying too is it's doing some work on yourself. It's not that person needs to change or that situation needs to change or that has to change. It's looking at you yourself and what you can do differently and where you want to improve and taking responsibility for that. And that's and it's take, yes. And it's taking those actions to that. A lot of times I'm talking to clients individually and I coach them individually. I say, you take you with you. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Everywhere you go, you was going. Right. Take you, you was there. Right. So when you do that, look at you. Yeah. Like if you want to change jobs, you want to change positions, you want to be higher, you want to go there. Oh, they get they killing me at this job. So let me go to another job. Okay. Reassess, reevaluate. Why was things going on with there? Was it toxic or was I just not applying myself? Right. Had, had I got lazy with the skills I learned and didn't grow anymore? Or were they picking on me for being there? Yeah. So start looking at those things and then make some changes in your own self. You should say, oh, wow. Now when you go somewhere and you've improved yourself, when you go to that next place, you'll be a better self. Right. It's all about self-awareness. And, 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 and coaches have helped me so much with that because there's so much. We, we're very good at seeing things in other people and how they oh, need to change and what they can do differently. But then when it comes to us, it's harder. And so that's why I've worked with lots of different coaches. I still do. They help me see things from other perspectives that you can't get from reading a book. And, okay. and even sometimes from doing that introspection, you need to like share, well, this is what happened, how I see it. And then they kind of can help you navigate that. And they, and they don't, they don't gloss over the fear. Yes. It's, yes. It's fearful. Yes. It's daunting, but you have to ask yourself, do I want to change? Right. Do I want to be the same? And if you start changing, you will realize that others will start changing how they look at you. Yeah. You realize how your present your presentation of yourself will now change 
how the outlook is of you. Right. Those all things start with you. So that's why I say vulnerability is individual. I can't grab your vulnerability and say, okay, I'm going to take that on. I'm going right. to help you get rid of this. Only thing I can do is expose it to you to work with. Once I do that, my coaching is there. You got this at that point right. in time. Yeah. Let's see. Kevin wrote, we're experts in everyone else's job <laughs> challenges and stuff. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we are. And that's and, and, and no one wants to do a self-evaluation. You can go online right now. And just look up all of the coaches. And last I checked, it was about like 440 something million coaches. And that may number may be slightly deflated by me speaking it. But there's so many coaches. So when I decided to say I want to be a coach and consultant, it was a C out there. And I said, what can make me different? What makes me different? Not what I'm going to put on as a show to differentiate myself from the C of people that's out there, but what is it that's in me that's different than the right. people out there? And me living in my vulnerability was different. So I said, yeah. that's it. That's what I'm going to market. I'm going to market me. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it took some time and it took some time and people, 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 and it actually, it took some time, but it came at a great time mm -hmm. because now everybody is talking about that to some, to some degree, everybody is aware about it to some degree. And a lot of people are getting the understanding that, you know, I have to change me in order for me to change. Yeah. We're at a good time right now. No, I agree. I think a lot of people are, are looking inward, looking at themselves and, and there are a lot of coaches. And so that's why people need to be really selective when they, if they decide yeah. to work with a coach, you got to interview that coach um, yeah. too. And the coach needs to really make sure that they can help that client. And somebody with my similar background might resonate with me, somebody with your similar background, or it doesn't even have to be a similar background, but you just resonate with different people. And I always say to invest in a coach that's investing in themselves. Absolutely. Cause you don't want to, you don't want to coach. It, it's sort of like, I think the funny thing used to be back in the day of Richard Simmons and the diets. Uh, you don't want a fat guy telling you he's on a diet, right? right. And, and there's no disrespect to fat people, but when you talk about fitness, and you want to be fit and you talking about the gym and then you got a guy that's training you and he's eating Twinkies and Ho-Hos. Like, what is the optics to that? Yeah. You don't want someone who doesn't know anything about vulnerability to coach you and what Carl. You, you don't want anybody to do that. So I definitely, I definitely uh, advocate for that. Do your answer uh, viewing process. Find out what that coach can offer you. Find out, are they the ones for you? Just because of what I talk about, it does. I've had clients that say, nah, I think you're a little much for me. I don't mm -hmm. have a problem with that. Yeah, I don't. I've had some people say, now nah. I've had some people stop in the midst. Mm -hmm. They signed on and, and we got to work it through some regiments. And they was like, I don't think this is the way I want it to be. The change has to come from you. Right, right. So I'm, I'm not going to push it. Coach, I'm not going to push it. Let me ask you a question. What the heck are you doing going to law school? I don't know what your age is, but you mentioned going into the army at, at in the 80s. So you're probably around my age. You do have five, a little break four. here, huh? Five, four. 54. Okay. I'm four years older than you. Okay. Yes, what are you doing going to law school at age 54? It is, it is a, it's a lifelong journey. Like I said about the Perry Mason and I can still see him standing there beating down the defendants in the black suit because the TV was black and white at that time. I'm telling my age on that. And it had a knob. <laughs> we didn't have remotes back then. So I had to turn the knob to change the channel. But it was it was the point of saying that something was not finished. That was a dream of mine. And once my kids went and graduated, I had one that's graduated from college, one about to graduate shortly. It came a point in my time where the opportunity was there for me to do and go after what my passion was. And then the pandemic came and I said, oh, now I can work on both passions. Because now I don't have to work about so much as going back and forth to the nine and fives. Now yeah. I can work on the vulnerability part that I really been want to open up about. Then I can work on the law part. It's always been my dream. So they start to marry. So now I'm even going further than that. Because now I don't want to go, I don't want to go into courtrooms now. Mm -hmm. Now I want to advocate and train and have workshops in and 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 seminars and webinars for attorneys to learn about the soft sides of the business, how you can engage and get more clients, not by ambulance chasing, but by just being that different attorney. You see what comes your way from there. So I'm still growing, Emily. I'm still growing. As long as I'm breathing, I'm growing. Yeah, I know. I think that's awesome. You, you were telling me before we started the show that you already have like 
six assignments due on September 6th yeah, or something. That was the first night of uh, class. I actually got all my syllabus last week. Uh, they tend to do things a little quicker at uh, school. And uh, I had my first class started tonight, actually, with some assignments. And my first professor, uh, they shot me an email and they said, okay, I gave you this assignments. And I look, and I'm like, okay, and read these chapters. And they're all due by September 6th. And I said, okay, one, two. So she gave me an assignment for every day, actually, and two chapters per assignment and two assignments and then the quiz. So by the, this time next week, I've had totally, it's, it'll be like eight or nine assignments, including the quiz and the, and the assignment write-ups. But um, it is what it is. I'm going but to get it, it done. But it's something that you're really interested in. Like, yes. did you, you, did, you did go to college Mm -hmm. earlier too yes. so so I went to college at 19 but imagine if you'd gone to college at 18 19 well, between that and now I, I i look at that and i say no i don't go i don't backtrack and i do that for i do that for a couple of reasons for one i couldn't tell my older self i couldn't tell my younger self the stuff i know now and if right. i did tell my younger self we wouldn't listen right so <laughs> that's one of the things and the second thing is that timing is everything yeah, yeah. So at that point in time, with the life that I had and how I was, I don't know if I would have been effective. Right. I probably would have been more damaged than good. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's what we really have to be. I, I don't advocate in saying what, what my 50-year-old self would tell my 25-year-old self. Because more than likely, the 25-year-old self was told that by a 50-year-old and you didn't listen. But I'm just saying that I think that school is more interesting to you now because, and also because of yeah. what you're studying. It's more interesting. Yeah. I come to find out that I get dubbed a teacher's pet, I think, a lot of times because a lot of professors are maybe in my age range. Or, and we we talk about experiences and we apply that to the classwork. Right. And it gives a better understanding because I've been in class uh, last semester. Me and a professor, we kind of like talk to class together. Because we just talked about so many experiences and he was like, yeah, Carl, explain this to the class. And I'm like, you kind of putting me out there. But, but he was excited about some of the things I was sharing. And likewise, and then some of the other kids was like, well, Mr. Carl, why are they? And I was like, oh, no, this is pretty good. So I like it. So right now, I think if I'd have went and been that, trying to be that attorney at 19, I don't yeah. think it would have worked out. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely get it. My son is in college studying engineering. He just turned 28. And he's still got two more years of school, but he, I can just see that he's a different person than he was when he was 18. He, he kind of went to college, but didn't really, didn't interest him. Now he loves it. He shows me his notebooks. They're, I'm like, is this my same son that I raised? Because his notebooks are neat. They're organized. Meticulous. He shows all his work and the math assignments. Yeah. See, we've come a long, we come a long way. Emily. We've come a long way. <laughs> Ideal. I, I think I would be the ideal student. Now. I remember that I was so smart, and by me is skipping grade. I skipped sixth grade, and I skipped. I skipped. No, I skipped fourth grade, and I skipped sixth grade. So I skipped two grades. So when I graduated from high school, I was really seventeen, going into eighteen, and then I had to wait to go in the army. My mom actually had to sign for me to join the army because I wasn't old enough. Wow! And that was a god gift because I was able to learn and retain and keep. I never carry books. I put them in my book bag because it wasn't a cool thing to do, first and foremost. And secondly, it wasn't cool for me to show that I was a nerd either. Right. So I, I didn't carry books. I kept them in the lockers. But I wasted so much good involvement that could have taken place in those four years of high school that I really had. I regretted for a long time. And then I changed that regret and so mm -hmm. making the circumstances in my favor. But I regretted not taking advantage of that. And now I'm just like a totally complete student. I'm meticulous in my notes. I keep good books. I, I, I take my books to class. I actually read the chapters that's assigned to me instead of skimming through them to get education. Uh -huh. So yeah. Yeah. And then not only that, I'm paying for it. <laughs> right, 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 right. I, I just think it's awesome. I think you're right. You could look back and think, oh, I could have done that differently. I should have done that differently. But you got to let all that go because you can't change it. And look at where it's gotten you. It's gotten, look at how everything came together from when you were watching the Perry Mason show, your reading, your, your, your brain, your curiosity, your experience in the army that you went through and how it's all come together and led to 
And you can't always see that if somebody's watching and they're 18 now or 20 now or 25, you can't always see where it's going to come, but just trust that it's going to lead to something awesome. It does. And, 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 and the good thing about it and the positive thing about it and the thing that you can own, it's your journey. It's your story. No one can write that for you. And that is what been one of the magnificent things that I've seen in transformation of clients that I dealt with, or just people that I share posts with or information with. I get so many DMs about, oh, that was me. This was about me. I needed that. Those are the kind of things that fuel you to continue, not just for the purpose of glory, but for the purpose of you seeing people's lives change and they're getting it. It's right. a good feeling to get it. When you're teaching somebody something and they pick it up, oh, I used to talk to my teachers. They say that's like heaven to them. Yeah. I've gotten through. And this is why I do what I do. I want to get through. I want you to know that it's a better you within you. There definitely is. And I like what you said too about, I think you said something earlier about the, how we sometimes just go to a job because we have to make a living, but we're not, it's not a job that suits us. Yeah. And I just took an assessment. It's called Emergenetics. But you see that blue on there, okay? You see the blue on that triangle? That blue is analytical, okay? I do not like doing math. I do not like analyzing data. I do not like the analytical stuff. I've known that about myself. But for the longest time, working in the Department of Defense as a contracting officer, having- Analytical. To, yeah, and I, and I was stressed and I didn't like it as much. And some things I liked, but not that part of it. And it's like, I thought, well, I never really looked at something like this to realize my strengths are in these other areas. And 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 that's what I that's what I would say also to the young eighteen year old. If you haven't if you haven't decided you haven't made up your mind, go be with you want to be. I know, and this is going to sound like parents don't beat me up for this one and don't cancel coach <clears throat> don't coach or cancel me. I've already said, let your kid find their passion yeah. and let them go after it. I know we have this. My mom's a CPA, so our thing when we was growing up numbers, like we played numbers games. We, 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 we got presents. If we can, we went grocery shopping, we can get a snack. If we told her how much was that 60% off of that grocery item. The first one told her once she made the games intriguing and, and, and learning. And of course I look at it now and I'm glad I'm right. happy for that. I spent so much time in finance and, and in accounting and learning and control of being in control. I was a controller. I was accountant, cost accountant. I did procurement. I, I mean, like a, Accounting sucks to me. I yeah. never liked it. Doesn't but bring it was, you energy. It's but it was a energy. push. Yeah, it was yeah. a push. It was a parent push, and I yeah. wanted to do. But I was that wasn't my passion. That didn't what that wasn't that drive me. So now when I my I had my kids, I said, "I'm get into what you love." I didn't push them to say you go here, you go there. Only thing I wanted them to do was enjoy what they were, be passionate about something, find something that drives you. So it's not a job; it's your passion. Right. Work, work in that, you know. Yep. And and the, that. Yeah. And the way you can tell if it if, if it's something that you love is like, do you get excited every day when you get up? Are yes. you like excited to do it? Do you feel like expansive energy or do you feel like, oh, I gotta go to work today? If you're feeling that way, work with a coach or do some of that inner work to figure out, well, what really would I love? And then when we think about it, we say, well, yeah, I would love that, but I can't do it because, well, those are limiting beliefs. Maybe you could, what if you could do it? Yeah. So, what if you could yeah. do it? Yeah. So, You're so, going so. after what you love. I, I'm so, uh, you got three yeah. more semesters, right? Yes. Three more semesters. And then I am done. I'm going to be an Esquire to the end of my name. And then I'm going to uh, take it another level. Then we're going in and going to talk and, and get with some attorneys and see if we can do some workshops and start bringing in some of this vulnerability into areas and organizations that have rolled for so many lines, so many years, that traditionalism that we want to change the narrative of that. And I like to do that with each and every individual that comes across my path. I don't have a set number. I don't right. have a set. I'm not one to say, yeah, I want to transform a million people by 2025. I'm not putting yeah. no numbers on mine. Yeah. No numbers on who I touch, no numbers on who I reach. I just want to reach people. Yeah. Even if you reach one, I mean, that's absolutely. That's I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So let's see. I've got a couple banners here that show how people can find you. You have yes. a Facebook page, exactly. Carl Sean uh, Watkins Consulting, and you're also on Instagram at Carl Sean Watkins Consulting. 
he's on LinkedIn as well. I didn't put that on there. So Carl, Carl S. Watkins one. I'll just yeah. look up the vulnerability guy. Somebody told me to put that in my, <laughs> somebody told me to put that in my profile. I said, no, I won't do that. I don't want to scare people away. But if they see, if they see anything yeah. concerning me or they see any posts that I know, I don't have to broadcast it. They know it. They see it. I live it. It's how I am. You live it. And I don't change it. Yeah. And you're on, you're on all these different live shows and stuff like that. Absolutely. Advocating and, uh, for it. Advocating for yeah. it. Yeah. You have your own live show. You had me on there once. We're, yes, yes, yes. I felt like an imposter. We were talking about imposter syndrome. Absolutely. I remember that. We were talking about imposter syndrome. And I, I think I'm, I'm doing a couple of collabs now. I got a collaboration with uh, Tracy Borison. And we we get into uh, the school thing. And she talks about the authentic and authenticity. And I said, oh, let's marry that with the vulnerability and how those two work together. So mm -hmm. we got on the Zoom and talked a couple of hours. It was supposed to be a half hour call. We ended up talking like two and a half hours. Then. That's awesome. And when we got done, she had this little structure for a show, the outline. And I was like, oh, I like that. So every Monday, um, uh, beginning uh, September the 13th, 6 p.m., we're going to be doing Authentic Leadership 101. And we're just going to be walking through what it is to be authentic and vulnerable and leader and corporations and working. We're going to cover the whole gamut. And it's just going to be a safe place, too. And I appreciate everybody that came out to that uh, mm -hmm. last Monday. I had a teaser episode to kind of introduce it. And uh, that's going to be great. I had a lot of people show up for that and a lot of people engaged, such as they do on your show. Yeah. Well, and so it, I want to make a shout out to all of the people. Yes. Uh, oh, so wait. Nadine says, up until today, vulnerability belonged to Brene Brown. <laughs> now it's Carl Sean Watkins you're talking Yeah, about. when I first started talking about it, I'm going to say this, and then I know you gotta, we got to go. When I first uh, started talking about that, it was very few things that I read of hers. And I didn't say that I disrespect, I just didn't know who she was. You just didn't know, yeah. I had yeah. an idea, and I wasn't in, into that into that arena with that. It was a lifestyle for me. It wasn't a research. It wasn't mm -hmm. a teaching assignment. It was how I lived. Yeah. So to me, when I start writing about it, I wrote experience wise. And I mm -hmm. and I think I my very first post, I think I wrote, I'm not Brene Brown, but here goes. <laughs> and from that point on, I just never stopped writing about vulnerability. But I see it from an aspect and a perspective that she cannot, regardless yeah. of the research. I mean, I'm an African American, I'm a male, I came from the Chicago, right. the hood. I got so many experiences that Brene Brown sitting at home in a university in Texas has not experienced yeah no to me though jeff daniel i used to work with him i don't know him but yeah. thank you to everybody that showed yes, up tonight it's interesting when you do live shows there's so many of them out there now and mm -hmm. so you you always hope somebody listens this is also going to be published later as a regular podcast episode okay. um, for the onward podcast and i'll like it'll be in a, in a in a month or two carl sean so i'll like when it comes out and i just really enjoyed talking with you and thank you so much for having me on the show if somebody's what i mean wait a second why did i say thank you so much for having me on the show thank, thank you so much you. for being on my show and if somebody's watching this and is thinking whoa i want to do a live show tim Sowen, let me hear um, Tim was a legend i took his class he's also showed me a whole lot about doing shows and and streaming and live streaming if anybody does not know him please connect with him he is a genius yeah, I was gonna. I was just um, on a Zoom call with him. The, there he is, right there. I was on a Zoom call with him the other night. So connect with Tim because yes. he does some courses on how to do live streams, how to make your live streams better, things like that. So yes, absolutely. Um, Eric, thank you, everybody that came yes. by. Appreciate you guys. Thank you, Carl Sean, for being such an awesome guest on the Onward Podcast, and I'm honored to be publishing your episode on Veterans Day. If you're listening to this today on the day it came out, November 11th, 2021, thank you to all of the veterans who have served our country. Have you heard about the positive intelligence coaching program that I offer? It's all about strengthening your mental fitness and that of your employees. You know, a high performing team needs to have the right foundation. Otherwise, they're going to keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. You're probably already aware that training people only once rarely works. To get consistent results, leaders must continuously develop their people, hopefully getting a return on their investment. 
you will definitely get a return on your investment with the positive intelligence slash mental fitness coaching program that I offer. I offer it on behalf of Shirzad Shamin, who is a New York Times bestselling author of the book, Positive Intelligence. What's awesome about this coaching program is that you use an app, an app on your phone, and it's a guided program, and it includes weekly one-hour video sessions and daily mental fitness reminders. And then you also get seven facilitated accountability sessions with your positive intelligence coach, and that is me. If you want to learn more, you can schedule a meeting to talk with me or message me on LinkedIn or Facebook. Recently, several small businesses have reached out to me asking me to coach their teams. Some of them want their leadership teams coached. Others are asking for teams of newly promoted supervisors to be coached. If you just heard that rustling in the background, that's my dog, Pearl. She doesn't seem to recognize when I'm recording. And I'm not going to record that over because actually right now I'm kind of hungry and I'm getting ready to go live to talk with my Naval Academy roommate about the mental fitness coaching program. So you can wait for that episode to come out or you could go to my LinkedIn profile or my YouTube channel and find the video that from their live recording on November the 3rd. Have a great week, everybody, and let's move onward together. Together.